topic is how pharmaceutical companies developing a vaccine for COVID-19 can protect themselves from cyber hackers. To discuss that, I'm joined by Christopher Hart. He is Director of Cybersecurity with Cylumina. Hello, Chris. How you doing, Robert? And Yossi Applebaum. He is CEO of Sepio Systems. Hello, Yossi. Hi, thank you for your time today. Let me ask you, I'll start with you, Yossi, just with his general question. And as pharmaceutical companies develop, uh, engage in vaccine research, where are the biggest risks and vulnerabilities that they face today from cyber hackers? Well, we see a going trend. It's actually exponentially growing trend of uh, interest. And eventually it comes with, uh, followed by attacks from bad actors against these uh, stealing the IP, disrupting manufacturing, and so on, mostly coming from nations, but also, you know, criminals and terrorists that would like to disrupt some activity in, into the market. So pharma, because of the this time, gets a lot of attention and in, in growing, uh, in increasing a number of attacks around, uh, around them. Hmm. How would you assess the security of their systems? Are they... Are they very sophisticated? Are they behind the curve uh, compared with other industries? So first we see more and more uh, young companies that become big players into the COVID uh, vaccine, for example. And because of that, I would sus suspect, and it's actually an educated guess uh, without uh, getting into details, that many of them are not set yet with the full uh, stack of security as you would expect from the big companies. So they were quite young startups a year ago, and now there are you know, billions of dollars companies with thousands of, of employees. And, and, and that's one issue. The second issue, even the big ones are in many cases set to the threats of a normal bio or pharma company two years ago and it's an interesting industry, but not top five. Now it's actually top two or top three. And because of that, the attention they are getting is like financial institutions two years ago. So I, I, I suspect they are not ready for the threats yeah. they are facing today. Chris, uh, Christopher Hart, what's your view on that, on, on vulnerabilities and weaknesses in the pharma supply chains and vaccine research, research right now? You know, I mean, pharma is in a, I wouldn't say unique, but in a very uh, precarious position and, and it's sort of an exclusive club when you have threats coming from all over. You know, your, your typical pharma or life science biotech, uh, they have to worry about the integrity of the, the data that they're generating, the confidentiality of that, because product life cycles are, are sometimes measured in, in a decade or more. Um, and the, you, you're generating or you're building medical platforms or in some cases medicines that are used in the human body. So the, the, the traditional confidentiality, integrity and availability triad is critical. Most organizations or most industries are leveraged to, are levered to one or two of those. Pharma's levered to all three. So they, they really have their hands full. Um, and in any, anytime you have a lot of threats coming from a lot of different areas, you have to make business choices. I mean, that's, that's the way it works. You, you make business choices. And with the industry changing so fast, both the technology that the uh, pharmaceutical companies are using, as well as the technology, very similar technology, what the pharmaceutical company is using, that the adversaries are using, and the ease of access to that technology has really ratcheted down the bar. For yeah. you know, what used to be a nation state type of threat now is a commoditized solution that's available on the dark web for, uh, for pennies. Wow. Now, like all businesses and indeed all individuals in the internet age, pharmaceutical companies are dealing with many types of monitors, routers, keyboards, and all, all other kinds of devices. You will see, how can these devices be weaponized to steal information? I, I'll answer that in a second. I would just add that in today's work from home, and it actually affects this organization also. It's right. way more than just the enterprise grade uh, equipment is the BYOD that becomes in many aspects, the go to the organization in terms of hardware because people are using their own computer in many aspects. And that's even worse than that. Now back to your question, eventually weaponizing hardware is a, becoming a almost commodity technology today, as Chris mentioned, it used to be nations 
you know, I, I came from the Israeli intelligence in my past, operations like that, and of course Israel has nothing to do with offensive cyber, but uh, I need to come back sometime to Israel. But uh, the, the issue is that really, really very few uh, nations add that technology. Now it's literally commodity and weaponizing comes in three different ways. First, supply chain, and no organization has any control on their supply chain anymore. You go to Best Buy and buy something because you need something. That's one. Uh, the second one is insiders. And again, in a normal environment, insider needs to get into a gated environment. Now knocking on your door or breaking into your house. And we have incidents all around the world involved with insiders and carriers and social uh, uh, play, game play uh, into that. And the third one, uh, which is eventually almost like uh, taking leverage of uh, vulnerabilities within devices. So device was not designed to be rogue, but taking leverage of the vulnerabilities of the device and use that as a, a method to weaponize the device and use it against the user becomes really, a, again, commodity and, and widely spread and used. Yeah, but when I hear about even keyboards, I mean, that, that how is a keyboard make you vulnerable? So one of the common attacks uh, that many pen testers, by the way, is using it is actually sending keystroke campaign, like literally having a small robot that sends a keyboard a keystroke campaign and running a script without copying a file. So endpoint security is totally blinded. Network security has nothing to do with that. And that's the way to get in. When you get in, they start to shut down the endpoint security, shut down many services, and exfiltrate data through different uh, methods. And by doing that, uh, we see keyboard mouses, barcode scanners, uh, biometric sensors, and many, many other input devices used in order to inject and eject uh, data, almost like conducting a command and control attack on a, even an air-gapped uh, and totally isolated environment. Yeah. Chris, why do these devices typically go undetected from existing security controls? You know, it, it really goes back to what I mentioned earlier with the, the, the technology is improving and becoming uh, commoditized. And not only you know, analytics and cloud technologies and machine learning and, and all of that stuff, which adversaries are using to develop solutions like, uh, uh, like ransomware as a service, um, but also on the hardware side, we want cheap hardware, we want cheap phones, we want cheap computers. Well, along with that has, you know, along with that, that, that life cycle has developed very cheap adversarial capabilities. So what may look like a little, uh, a little USB drive uh, can actually be a full blown PC that will test two, 3000 different vulnerabilities on the machine simply by plugging it in. And when you have a USB connection, you're not so much looking like someone else. This isn't someone else in your network. This is really, it looks like whoever's setting at the PC. So you know, fundamentally, it's, it really comes down to, to the old basics. You know, the, the complacency is, is our, biggest, uh, our biggest threat. Um, we have to continually be evaluating these new technologies that come out and, and see, do they give us better visibility into spaces we hadn't previously known. Five mm -hmm. or six years ago, understanding all of the doodads and whiz-bangs that are plugged into a PC wasn't so important. Today, it's, it's becoming critical. It's absolutely becoming critical. But with, as you guys mentioned, the existence of these hackers tools, virtually off the shelf kinds of, uh, kinds of things that are available, they're familiar. I would think then that those seeking to protect companies against those types of tools would be able to develop things that could frustrate them. I mean, does the tech, is this a question of, I mean, the technology exists to stop hackers, yes or no. And is it more a question of people's vigilance and willingness to adopt the right tech tools. But you know, Yossi, are the tech tools there to protect companies? Well, you know, that's what we do in Sepio. And, and actually, shockingly, when we started Sepio uh, after four and a half years ago, after many, many years in the industry, you know, I'm doing it for like literally 30 years, uh, we keep, you know, pinching ourselves every morning to 
actually figure out that there is no too many, I'll be honest, uh, too many solutions uh, uh, to solve this problem. And there are many reasons for that. First, sometimes at the beginning, now it's less, but lack of understanding, lack of awareness, and lack of belief that there is a easy to use, easy to deploy, a solution that can provide a robust solution uh, to that threat. So, you know, we keep talking to really large companies and we keep hearing that, well, that's really interesting because we didn't think this can happen to us. Sometimes they know it can happen to them before talking to us and sometimes hopefully not. And in addition to that, it's shocking that there is a solution. Now I'm not promoting Sepio. I think the problem is bigger than one company to, to solve the problem. I, I think the main issue is that awareness is a key and, and it's not just the private market. We keep talking about pharma today, but it starts with governments. Uh, and in and, and many cases, uh, we keep hearing uh, governments that on the attack side, they have the technology on the defense side. They don't really know they need to prevent that because there is a disconnection between one angle of the government to the other angle of the government. Yeah. Uh, and I've been in that game, so I know exactly what, what happens. But I would say that a lack of understanding and lack of belief of solutions, it's a huge a failure in, in the entire industry. And the, and the criminals are actually having fun because of that. It's almost as easy as a deploying a tool and waiting for the, you know, the rock device call home to the attacker. They really, really don't concern about being caught because if we are not there and there are a few more, you know, semi solutions, they will never be caught. We keep finding attack tools that are deployed for months or even years before we found them. Yeah, but I keep hearing, it sounds like you guys are basically saying that the problem is people, not technology. The technology is there if we know how to use it and we are uh, vigilant enough to use it properly. Christopher, is that the case or are the bad guys technology, is it keeping one pace ahead of the good guys technology? I, I wouldn't necessarily say it's one pace ahead as much as it's keeping pace. Um, it, it, it's almost lockstep. And, and it is a matter of both. You know, one of the biggest challenges that most CISOs in, be it pharma life sciences or, or you know, uh, aviation, um, uh, industrial engineering, getting people, qualified people, talented people on board is huge. There's a huge undersupply of, of talented engineering resources out there. So the technology, I think we're, we're keeping pace. The technology is there. I think when you look at some of the large institutions, the, the, the big industrials, when you look at uh, critical infrastructure organizations, as well as you know, the federal government, I think early adoption of that technology and, and bringing it in and helping to fund it and creating a, a, an economic environment where that thrives is, is absolutely essential. So right. I think you need both of those things. It is a technology thing. Um, but it is it also very, very much a people thing. But this is a critical discussion at a time when the vaccine is just on the verge of being distributed to hundreds of millions, if not billions of people on the, on the planet. Yossi, what do you think is the biggest global threat to pharma today, given the fact that the vaccine research is at such a premium right now? I think two. Uh, one is disruption of manufacturing and, and supply chain of that. And that's a major issue because, as you said, we need to all of us need to be vaccinated within the time frame of several months. We're talking about 9 billion people. So even, you know, it's, there was nothing like that in the human history in terms of supply chain management and, and things like that. Just a simple uh, supply chain attack uh, on, the free, on the freezers that, you know, the dry cooling that is keeping the, the vaccines uh, ready to use will cause, forget about the, economical damage just on the health damage is huge. And the second one is IP theft. Uh, these companies now valuated by tens of billions of dollars or even more, if someone will steal their IP, it's, and you know, the damage can be, again, nothing we've seen in, in the past. Yeah. 
Well, this is one huge wake-up call, I think, for the pharma business, especially now at this critical time when we must get the vaccine out safely and securely. I want to thank both of you, Christopher Hart of Silumina, Yossi Applebaum of Sepio Systems, for this very deep and excellent insight into this critical problem we're facing today. Thanks to both of you for being with me today. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you.